one of the one of the first people to really understand that in a very different way is a really amazing scientist called Margaret Dayhoff. She was at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., or at the outskirts of Washington, D.C. And Margaret Dayhoff, early on in, in the history of kind of sequencing of different organisms, published what was called the Protein Atlas. And this is back in the 1970s, okay? So we only had like, you know, three or four sequences, maybe a dozen, maybe a hundred, not very many sequences. Um, and in fact, the very first um, version of what Margaret Dayhoff eventually developed into being what's called the point accepted mutation rate started with about 71 different protein families. Okay? Protein families. And so what Dr. Dayhoff did was to take these protein families and to make very careful alignments of them and then to count Every time you switch from a tyrosine to a phenylalanine, and every time you switch from a tyrosine to an aspartic acid. And in fact, she didn't just focus on tyrosine and aspartic acid and phenylalanine because that would be a bit weird. She calculated the frequencies of going from every amino acid to every other amino acid in groups of really closely related proteins. So the idea is, let's let evolution tell us how hard it is for proteins to switch from tyrosine to phenylalanine or tyrosine to aspartic acid. I said, holy moly, that's gonna break my protein, but maybe it doesn't, right? But the way we can find out is by just taking a look at evolution and saying, how frequently do we see a tyrosine switching to a phenylalanine where we believe it's the same protein and how frequently do we see it switching to aspartic acid? So um, Dr. Dayhoff took proteins that were greater than or equal to 85% similar, and she looked at 1,572 changes among those proteins. And she said at each point, this is the frequency with which a mutation is accepted, and hence it became the point accepted mutation of the table. A little bit later, uh, Stephen and Georgia Heinkoff. Um, in uh, Margaret Dayhoff did this uh, starting in the 1970s, but really carried on for a very long time studying this phenomenon. The Heinkoffs did this uh, starting in, in 1992, and they took a slightly different approach, which was to take protein alignments and what we haven't really talked about yet, but we we will get to, is that very often proteins have what are called domains that are very, very highly conserved, and then the rest of the protein is very different. And this is evolution just cheating. The idea is that um, if you figured out how to do something, let's just use what we figured out before, let's not figure it out from scratch again. So for example, one uh, very common domain is called a dehydrogenase. And so what that means is that you're taking, you've got two chemical compounds like those two that I just drew, and one has um, an H and one has an OH, and you take those away and you get H2O. And so all that dehydrogenase means is you're just taking away water. This is a really common thing because when you do that, whatever's bound here and whatever's bound here, you can stick them together. So once we've figured out how to take water away, we don't need to go and invent that from scratch, right? We can just steal it. And so what the Heinkoff said is, hey, there are these domains. The rest of the protein may not be very similar, but there are regions that are really similar. And so if we take, uh, you can call them domains, or you can call them blocks. If we take blocks, 
we can basically do a very similar calculation as um, Margaret Dayhoff did, and we can come up with an exchange between um, a different the frequencies with which amino acids change between different positions. So we have two slightly different versions of the same thing. On this side, it's called blossom, and on this side, it's called PAM. And depending on your personal preference, you can basically use either of them. And for each different version, um, there are within them, there are also different versions. So the common versions of PAM are 100, 120, 160, 200, 250. Um, and what this means, this is the number of mutations per 100 amino acids. So this means you have two and a half mutations per amino acid. Okay, expected. And it's basically how similar the proteins are that you put into the table to do this calculation to calculate the frequencies. And then in Blossom, a very typical range of Blossom matrices would be somewhere around this range. And the numbers here are the percent identity of the proteins used. So the proteins that make up the Blossom 90 matrix were at least 90% identical. The proteins that make up the Blossom 80 matrix were at least 80% identical. And these two numbers are sort of like PAM 100, approximately Blossom 90. Not really, but kind of, OK? So as this number increases, as this number decreases, you're getting more divergent proteins. Most everybody in the history of the world uses Blossom 62 simply because, anybody know why? Why do you think everybody uses the Blossom 62 matrix? So the reason that everybody uses the Blossom 62 matrix is really simple. It's the default matrix in BLAST. So if you don't specify any parameters, you can say, I don't want to use Blossom 60, I want to use PAM 250 or PAM 100 or Blossom 90 or Blossom 45. You can change it to whatever you want, but nobody ever does that, right? Why would you change a parameter in a program? That's stupid. So everybody uses Blossom 62. 